in America. 16-year-old twins Georgia and Patterson Inman are the sole heirs to an estimated billion-dollar tobacco fortune left to them by their late father, Walker Inman Jr., nephew of Doris Duke, the richest little girl in the world. But the 16-year-old twin heirs to the Duke tobacco fortune consider their inheritance blood money. Before their father died of a drug overdose in 2010, few people knew that the same children who brought diamonds to school for show and tell were by their own accounts being terribly abused. For years, they say they lived a secret, hellish life filled with brutality, imprisonment, starvation, and at the tender age of four, they say they were forced to play the dangerous game of Russian roulette. In an exclusive interview, the twins are breaking their silence. They really wanted to talk to me because they feel that for years their voice was beaten down. And to finally be free, they must stand strong and speak out against those who they claim abused them so horribly for so many years. I wanted to speak to Georgia and Patterson individually because although they agree 100% on what happened to them, their interpretation of it is sometimes dramatically different. Patterson, for example, recalls being the wingman on wild and dangerous adventures with his action hero dad. But Georgia characterizes her father as a reckless drunk and drug user who constantly put them in harm's way. Thanks for sitting down and talking about this. What was it like physically in your house? If I walked in the front door during these times, what did it look like in there? What was the environment like? It smelled horrible. It smelled nasty. Just like it's a bunch of different, imagine putting a bunch of different chemicals together and having it soak through the walls. Was it dirty in there? Describe the food you ate. It's really gross. It's stale. It's not good. Sometimes that's all we had. That we had rats in our pantry, and that's why I didn't eat anymore, because I was so disgusted. Did the food have stuff growing on it? There was mold on it. We had rats that chewed through the cereal box. Where was your dad when this was going on? My Stay dad was never home. And if he was, he was always locked up in his bedroom, smoking meth, doing whatever. So he had no idea. He wasn't down here to protect you. Well, if he did, he was too high to even understand <clears throat> it. I watched my dad overdose like six times. He was helpless. He couldn't help us even if his life depended on it. If you did something wrong, how were you punished? I'd be beat really, really bad and locked in my bedroom Who with a deadbolt lock on the outside. My dad used to beat us really bad. What do you call really bad? He would hit us, physically hit us. With his fist? Where would he hit you? In the face, in the head. He used to just drop us on our heads because he wanted to make us stupid. He'd pick me up by my ankles. Here you go. He would pick you up by your ankles like this. Yes, and he would drop me. On your head. And then he tried telling everybody that we had fetal alcohol syndrome. We never did. We... He used to slice my feet up as well. Sliced your feet up? Yes. With what? Knives. On like the bottom of your feet, the tops, all over? Where, where would he cut you? He didn't care. <laughs> Did anyone help you? No, they didn't care. Did anyone treat your feet? Did they put medicine on them? No. He didn't care. Nobody cared. I've been told the story of, of your father slapping you in a restaurant <laughs> one day. I don't know why he did that, and I was not acting up. I do know that. 
What happened? I don't know. He just slapped me. We were talking, and he just slapped me really, really hard. He hit me right, right there, like really hard. And did you fall down, or? I just went forward real hard, came back up, and did looked at him and just kind of started crying. And then wiped my tears up and stuck it up. And it bothered some people that were having dinner, which I kind of feel bad for them. It felt bad for them. <laughs> it ruined their appetite. <laughs> what is your earliest recollection as a child? I remember being tipped in cribs. My brother remembers a lot. He was talking to me about it last night. He's just not going to come out and say it. It hurts him too bad. There's stuff that I don't even want to talk about. I just remember, man, he used to play Russian roulette with us. They thought it was funny. They played Russian roulette with you? Yes, they'd load the gun, they'd spin it, and they'd shoot it. At you? Me and my brother. One time the gun went off accidentally. And they were who to you? Nannies. They were there to care for you? Supposedly. To take care of you? I remember when they tied us up, like I had my hands behind my back and rope, and my feet were tied up. I had duct tape put over my mouth, my nose, I couldn't breathe. So she ripped it off, and then she put it back on. This time not over my nose. Maybe she was stupid. And I remember crying and screaming for somebody, but she told me to shut up and she'd hit me upside the head really hard. You said at one point that you had vomited and a nanny made you lick it up off the floor. What happened? She gave me pomegranate. She got mad because I couldn't eat it. It kept making me sick. So then I'm gonna lick it off the floor. So, yeah, it's really disgusting. Wow, wow. We're thrown down a flight of stairs. Yeah. It's not even the worst. There's so much more. I get flashbacks. I remember they'd stick us in tires in the basement. They would stick you in tires? How does that work? Well, you stack a tire on top of a tire. We can't get out, and we're tied up. Again, we had duct tape. We were tied, and we were sitting on the cement floors. And it was freezing. It was in the middle of winter. Tell me about the boiling bathtub. We got placed in hot water. There wasn't any cold water period. They just turned it all the way on hot and it scoped us really, really bad. I thought my skin was literally, I thought it was melting away. It feels like you're on, you're on fire. Was there a point at which you knew this isn't the way everybody else lives? No, I kind of just thought it was normal. You thought this is just life, and I don't want any more of it. Sometimes you'd say, I don't even want to be there. No, I was just <clears> open <throat> to God that he'd just take me. You know, I really didn't see the point. I didn't see it. These nannies, 57 people across time, these people would be there for how long before they would quit, get fired, or run off, or whatever? Some people could like see the way that we were living and be fired within a day because they couldn't handle it. These nannies, what would they see that would make them run for the gates? Coming up, George's twin brother Patterson is also haunted by their past. My dad, seeing him dueling and he was always high. There were times that you were hungry. There were times that you were locked up, true? There was a bunch of yelling in the kitchen. And we see this white guy. They put him on a chill. Did he die? Yeah, he died. Born billionaires, but starved, abused, and locked in a basement continues. Georgia Inman is a stunning teenager, the spitting image of her famous great aunt, Doris Duke. But Georgia says she wishes every day that she was not born into the Duke family dynasty. Georgia says she still has flashbacks and she shakes violently when she relives the memories she cannot escape. These nannies, what would they see that would make them run for the gates? The way that we were being treated. 
We wouldn't be fed. How long would you go without eating? Probably like two days at a time. So long enough that you were hungry. I trust that your life now is a whole lot better. Oh yeah. And that by comparison, you now see that that was not normal. When I saw my dad in the, his head in a garbage can, drool coming out of his mouth, you know, having to pour water on him and try to do CPR compressions on him, you know, I thought that was normal. I didn't really know that this isn't right. So you didn't know that this isn't also happening down the block or around the corner. This just isn't the way people live. That's just all you ever knew. Yeah, we were alienated from friendship, people, social, like we really didn't have a social life except for with the people that hurt us. Some people on the outside might look in and say, you know, look at all this money and wealth. For you, what was it like growing up with money? <laughs> Doesn't matter. It didn't matter to me. If somebody were to look at me like that and say, wow, I would say, you want to trade lives? I would trade somebody their life right now to have them live my whole life to live in my shoes. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted to be free. I was trapped because of it. It was blood money. That's what it is. Despite being born into American royalty, George's twin brother Patterson is haunted by a past filled with horrors that he says he can't erase from his mind. He is damaged by that history, yet strangely conflicted about blaming his beloved father because of all the fond memories he has of their extravagant adventures. It was only after I introduced the concept that you can still love a person, but not love certain behaviors or choices they made, did Patterson give himself permission to really speak candidly about the bad side of a good man when he was speaking of his father. How far back in your life do you remember? What's the earliest recollection you have? Like four years old. What do you remember? I know a couple of things, but they're not, not really pretty. I remember taking a flight to Japan, me and Georgia, my dad. We got off the plane and we, we got in a red vehicle and we were driving around. We stopped at this restaurant. There was a bunch of yelling in the kitchen and we see this white guy and he ran out of the kitchen. They got a hold of him. It was about stealing. Like I know the story, but I, mm -hmm. there's some gaps that are kind of missing. What's all right? Just tell me what you do remember. Well, they put him on a chair and the chair had big slits in the chair. Before they even put him in the chair, they actually stripped him nude they uh they took his pants off and was he strapped in i believe the men were on both sides of the chair holding his hands down but i do remember that i was really scared and they did stick an object between the slits and it was a looked like a, it was it looked like a bamboo stick and they uh they did it nice and slow and they just pushed it up and i could see the green piece i would like the splinters go up and his uh was he screaming yes like I could not believe. Did he die? Yeah, he died. In the chair? He died in the chair. The, the object went all the way through it. I turned him into a kebab. What did you say to yourself at the time? Do you remember what you thought? I was scared, I know that. I was crying like, a, you know, I was, I, was, I was terrified. I was, I got to like grab onto my father, you know, to hold him and brush me away. Why do you think he would allow you to be there for something like that? I think this whole thing was about stealing and teaching me a lesson at four years old. How, what happens when you steal? Which really didn't teach me. Jack actually didn't teach me anything. I think it really messed with my head like, like a lot. Well, you remember it today? Yeah. Well, listen, I am sorry that you lost your father. I know he meant a lot to you, uh, as mine did to me. But I learned something that helped me adjust myself, and that is I realized that I can love my father and not love everything he did. Yeah. You need to understand it's not a betrayal of your father to acknowledge there are things about him that were not okay. And taking a four-year-old in that situation goes on that list, right? I yeah. Mean, you wouldn't do that if you had a four-year-old son, would you? No. You'd uh, never allow him to see something like that. <laughs> I can't even handle it. Yeah. 
And it's okay to be mad at your dad about that. That doesn't mean you don't love him, and it doesn't mean you're being disloyal. It just means that was the bad side of a good man. Yeah. But we don't have to love the bad side. Like he was always high. That was kind of sad, you know, seeing him nodding out, drooling and moving back and forth with his legs crossed. I saw that every day. Did it confuse you when your dad would do things like that when you knew that he loved you and you knew that you loved him? Did it confuse you when he would do things to hurt you? Coming up. There were times that you were hungry. There were times that you were locked up. They were feeding me my own when they were like pretending it was food. How did that happen? Born billionaires, but starved, abused, and locked in a basement, continues. Did it confuse you when your dad would do things to hurt you? Yeah, like, we had explosives around the property. Like, dynamite explosives? They were like, they were steel objects about this big, and if I dropped it, it would blow, it could blow my half my body away. When he was high, he would, he dropped them all over the place, and I would go pick them up, and I would throw them, and they never ignited. But one time I picked them up, and I said, hey, Dad, look look what I found. And just slapped me across the face so hard, I thought, thought my teeth were gone. He, to he told me, uh, oh, you're lucky you didn't drop it. Well, how old were you? I'm going to be seven, six. Well, that's why you don't let kids play with things like that, because <laughs> they can't predict the result. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know it's going to blow up, but you don't realize it's going to blow your legs off. <laughs> yeah. Why would he let you be around things like that? He loved explosives, and he became a pyrotech. He was a smart guy. He was really good with math and science. Yeah. We did all kinds of things, you know, blow stuff up, shoot guns. Did all, it was really fun for me yeah, to see stuff. That was fun, of course. When you look back on some of the adventures that you had with your dad, some of those things are memories that you'll never forget. New Zealand. We had this boat down there. It's an 80-foot catch named Divine Decadence. Divine is spelled wrong because he forgot the E because he was so high at spelling the name. Yeah, New Zealand was a blast. My dad used to party out with the Hells Angels on the boat. Very nice people. Some of the hookers were kind of cool too, you know, I got to talk, chat up a storm as me as this young boy, you know. They were nice schools to be around. The hookers? Yeah. In New Zealand? <laughs> yep. So you had some really interesting experiences with your father, but do you get that if somebody was just reading an account and it was a story about a dad took his nine-year-old son to New Zealand and had drug parties on the boat with Hells Angels and hookers, <laughs> that there are those who would say, not the best parenting decision. Yeah, of course. At what point did it hit you like, Oh, yeah. The kid next to me at the mall, he probably didn't do this last weekend. A lot of kids, when I was up in Wyoming, they weren't allowed to my house because my dad was big into collecting uh, pornography. And then we had these big old gates. And the only way you could open the gates is if you grabbed onto the, the d and opened the gates. Right. And when the parents were coming to the house, because they didn't know, they wanted to know, meet my dad. That was a no-no. It was over. That was it? That was it. No that, kids at the house no more. <laughs> nope. There were only maybe two kids. Well, his name is Tate. That's all I'll say. And he was able to come into the home and, you know, explore and shoot guns with my father and see all the interesting things about my father. What sucked is my father didn't believe in wearing clothes either. So he had to, he'd walk around nude. <laughs> yeah, it was... Oh my, oh my gosh. How did he change when he was high? Because you know, he wasn't always high, I'm sure. He was always high, actually. Were you ever around him when he was sober? I don't think so. I know he took pills, and one time, I, like when I broke my arm, I snapped it. He was taking my pills. And that's how we got in a crash. When my stepmother was there, she started taking my stuff too, and we got in a car accident, crashed into a tree. Yeah, but she, he was always high. My stepmother, she was like very mean. How would she be mean to you? She'd tell me I'm stupid. I'm like, I'm retarded. I remember when I passed the third grade and I uh, was gonna go. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. Like when I passed the third grade, 
when I was going to go to fourth, she said, oh, I thought you were too stupid to even, you know, like to pass. My real mother was good because I remember like at eight years old, I was like clinging onto a leg and saying, don't leave me and stuff. Because she was not allowed to see us. Yeah, they told me she was a druggie and she was like this horrible person. What else are you going to believe? You know, you believe what you're told. Yeah. There were times that you were hungry. There were times that you were locked up. True? Yeah. Well, yeah, this house said they were, they were feeding me my own. So, say I was living in feast, you know, in a closet. I guess, you know, that could be my, I guess, my father's fault. He wasn't there at the time. It was actually. It was these people. How did that happen? I just remember being in a cl like in this like basement, and they were like pretending it was food and like chew chew, you know, just just being like thinking it's no one to feed me, you know. That. Where was your dad? Where was Dara Lee? I don't know where they were. When you think about that now. Does it make you mad? Does it make you sad? I'd like to have those so no, That's okay. I just like I'm putting a body bag. You know what? Despite what happened, despite what you went through, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a survivor. You're still here. Yeah. You're here. I don't want to be a victim. I want to be a victor. Well, you are. Uh, I hear you 100%. You know, the only way they have a chance to get away with this is if y'all had remained silent and by having the courage to stand up and say here's what happened and by God it wasn't right that's how they don't get away with it that's how none of them get away with it you telling the truth that's their worst nightmare you know, your dad when they told you that that he had died. Were you surprised? Coming up. He was pissed off over something. He said, if you hear like a blast, like don't bother walking in. Did it scare you when those things happened? And later. The minute she started driving fast and acting up like that, so I begged her to please slow down, you know? I, I thought she was gonna go like off this hill. I thought we were gonna just roll the way down and die. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview with Patterson Inman. Your dad, when they told you that, that he had died, were you surprised? Well, like, I was surprised because I thought he was going to live forever, you know. He told me, oh, I'm not going to die. Well, multiple times, I'd find him, like, OD'd one time in the vault. There was a bunch of pills in his hand. We never called the hospital, like the ambulance on that one. Daly told me to throw water at him and he would just wake up. So that's what I did. Did it scare you when those things happened? Yeah, it scared me. I, I didn't know what was going on. Do you think he was suicidal? No. You think he was just reckless? Yeah. Is there a story that involves a Luger? Yeah, there is a story. He was pissed off over something. He said, uh, -uh. I, I, like I'm just gonna kiss the Lugo. And if you like, if you hear like a blast, like don't bother walking in. So I, I didn't really understand what he was saying, but when I got older, I would understand. Do you get what I mean? He would, he would kill, kill himself. But I don't think he killed himself when he died. When he actually died, I don't think he wanted to die. How did you find out about your dad's passing? I remember trying to go at 14, I believe, to go see my dad's funeral. Like, it's just like, because I never really got to go see him when he died. Like, I, I saw him in Wyoming. It was like an, it was an open funeral, like an open coffin. Mm -hmm. They were giggling. Like, you know, they were just like laughing at my dad. What did you want to say to them? I'm going after them. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, because I, I mean, what they ought to be hearing from you is he's gone, but I'm not. I'm here and you're accountable. They showed me the, op the autopsy. I guess he died of, uh, it was opium and like, methamphetamine and stuff. 
It was just like a big mixture of drugs. What other forms of abuse did these people perpetrate? We know you've been hit. We know you've been sliced with a knife. We know you've been fed your own excrement. We know you've been locked up. There's things I do know, but I don't really want to talk about them. But some things I don't think people should know. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just want these people put away. I, I want to be able to be back at, at my homes and see my dad. Even though he's dead, I just want to sit right next to his, his tombstone. I know my dad better than anybody else does. I know he had a problem, you know, with uh, drugs. But he was a fun man uh, to be around as well, you know. I want to be able to see all these bad people in a jail cell with me giving a thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have a, a, a sense of loneliness when you were growing up because you couldn't have friends? Kinda. Kind of bothered me a little bit. Well, how about now? Do you have friends now? If you want to know the truth, I don't consider them friends. I do have friends, but the parents are more wanting to be my friend than the kids are wanting to be being my friend. The parents are all about money. When you have money, you start having these weird people be around you, and they just want you for money. So it's hard for you to trust Yeah, it, it's really hard. When really, I don't have any friends. I don't have any. If you could just write the script of what was going to happen over the next two or three years, what would it be? Well, I just want to get on with life. I want to be a kid again. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I just want people to know what happened. But I want to, I want to be back with my estate and be at home. And right now, because of the outstanding lawsuits, you are banned from your home. Yeah. I'm not even allowed to see my dad. You know what? Like, how is that even normal? Like, that's not okay. I'm, I'm pissed off. I'm, I'm sitting here right now having, having to deal with everything. And I can't just be left at Greenfield chilling out, you know, fishing and having fun. Instead, I'm dealing with all this nonsense that I shouldn't be dealing with. I'm coming after the bastards, and I, I hope they know, you know, there's a battle cry, and it's pretty serious. You know, they're going down. I, I hear you. It's important to me that you also know that people that have been through all manners of abuse, that does change who you are. Yeah. But those wounds heal. Well, I'll probably heal after everybody's put away. Coming up. I didn't even think I was gonna live to see my mom again. I thought I was gonna be dead. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview with Georgia Inman. You were listening to um, part of my interview with your brother Patterson, right? Was that hard to listen to for you? Tell, yes. tell, tell me why. Because I don't understand why all of the things that happened happened. I just, I don't know. I, I really wish my dad was here right now so that I could confront him. And it hurts me to hear that stuff because it's like, it's just like scarred. It's like trying to make sense out of nonsense, right? Yeah. When I was talking to your brother, he talked about an instance that happened when you were four years old in, in Japan. Patterson didn't tell you that they sliced open his stomach and his intestines was hanging out, and that's the reason he could see that go up. They told us they were going to teach us a lesson if we ever stole. And my dad and my brother tried to grab me because I was screaming, bloody murder. So my dad hurts run over my mouth. So, you're four years old, and you witness this man being impaled and disemboweled and dying. I saw his eyes sockets your dad... out and everything. My dad didn't say nothing. He was a chicken. I was scared. I thought that's what they were going to do to me. Do you have any idea? why your father took you there and, and let you witness that. You said teach you not to steal. The dude that murdered him told us if we ever stole from him, that's what would happen to us, but worse. My dad just called me a liar and a thief so that if I did ever 
open up like I tried to nobody would listen they just think I was crazy or making things up and then when I did open up he just go and splash cash wherever to whoever would take it oh yeah they keep their mouths shut to just pay them off yeah did you ever see him do that yes I mean how much would he give people would he give them five hundred dollars ten thousand what would he give them it was a thick wad of cash like just all hundreds big rolls of cash and he would pay them to Keep be their quiet mouth about shut. what abuse and neglect so these are people that would know what was happening to you and then he would just pay them to shut up yeah and they would and they would that's how he got away without ever being arrested that's how he got away without losing custody what do you say to yourself as a child when you reach out to an adult for help and then somebody comes in behind just pays them off shut up and you're not helped at all there's no hope when that happens to be honest with you I thought I was gonna be dead I didn't even think I was gonna live to see my mom again were you taken to the doctor when you would get sick Dr. Stiver is the only good doctor Dr. Stiver told my dad to his face that he's up and that he should go to hell and this was after the wreck, after Dr. Stiber had to pull glass out of my face. Because even though the airbag hit me, we went like 65, 70, hitting this tree. Who we was driving? Dara Lee. She took my dad's Suburban. I don't know why she took her truck, but thank God she took my dad's Suburban. Because if she didn't, I don't even think we would be here right now. I think me and my brother would be dead but the really weird thing was is that that morning when she woke us up to go to school it was like about five in the morning and she was dropping glass she had like this long glass clap and she just dropped it like she was like running into the walls and stuff and she and I was just like Daryl are you okay she smacked me and so I just shut up then after that she said get in the car right now you know she's just she was screaming I knew something wasn't right the minute she started acting driving fast and acting up like that so I begged her to please slow down you know I, th I thought she's gonna go like off this hill I thought we we're gonna just roll the way down and die because it's like a cliff and so I'm sitting here I'm screaming I'm begging him to slow down my brother he said oh my god and I said well now you've wrecked us and that's those were the last words that came out of my mouth and she hit the tree. Airbags in yeah. your face. It didn't really say me much. I mean, I guess it kept me from going completely through the windshield. Still had glass all stuck in my face and in my body. My brother got me out that day. I like literally thought I was gonna die. I guess the house little kid got me or something. Tell me that you understand that none of this was your fault. I understand that now. You do understand that now? Yeah. There wasn't anything you could do that justified what was done to you. You were an innocent party in an evil trap. Coming up. You understand the contrast. You're taking diamonds to school for show and tell, yeah. and nobody knows that you're locked in a room for days at a time. Yeah. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview with the Inman twins. We talked about the dark side of everything that's happened to y'all, um, but I, I want to talk just a minute about what the world saw. There were glamorous things about your life, right? N yeah. Did you travel on private jets? Oh, yeah. You had a sailboat that would sail around the world? Did you have pets? A oh. camel named Sinbad. A lion uh, named Harley. And a chimpanzee named Candy. Did you live differently than other kids at school? What would you take for show and tell? I did take valuables like, you know, diamonds and gold coins, cougarans. It's South African gold, and then I bung. You brought, to show and tell. Yeah, I thought it was kind of cool, you know. So our dad brought in the guns and swords and stuff, would show off all the like antiques that he had. I said, Dad, you know you're not supposed to bring weapons into the school, right? 
Where do you, do you bring those guns? I bring all of them, every single one yeah. you could think of. Yeah. Bring hand grenades to school. <clears throat> yeah, I just show the kids. You said that he liked to blow stuff up. Yeah, that, that's And a now hell you yeah. like to blow stuff up. What What would you guys blow up? We We blew up like trailer houses. <laughs> Blew up vehicles. Empty, like, I assume. Yeah. We blew up all kinds of things, like things that would make like a big explosion, like cars, school buses. We used to buy school buses from the junkyard and blow them in half. Yeah. So, yeah, he taught me some neat things, but don't do it because, you know, it's not okay now. You understand the contrast. You're taking diamonds to school for show and tell. Yeah. And nobody knows that you're locked in a room for days at a time. Yeah. That's the contrast, right, of, of what people would sometimes see versus what you were actually living. So, so they see this luxurious life, but at the same time, living hell. When you reconnected with your mom, at first, y'all thought she was a terrible person, right? Yeah. I thought she was everything my dad said she was, an alcoholic, drug addict. I think he called her a hooker, I believe. I understood you were throwing boulders at the car. We now return to The Darkness of Riches. Georgia and Patterson Inman don't want to be seen as victims. They are survivors. When they first began revealing the secrets of their past, they were shuddering and crying. But as they opened up, they became stronger and blossomed before our eyes. Now, finally, after years of being silent and afraid, they have found their voice. To being on the streets of Vegas, homeless and panhandling to survive. It is the nightmare of every parent. How do you go from seemingly one day everything's fine to a train wreck? Her father Ray says summer was the apple of his eye until things started going downhill three years ago when he says he kicked his wife out for cheating. He recently told a judge he is done with summer's out of control behavior and that she's no longer welcome to live in his house. Her mother, Dina, says she wants custody of Summer, but she said, frankly, I just can't afford to raise her. Get away from me. Summer's out of control and violent. I noticed a change in Summer in seventh grade, getting in fights after school, her throwing a rock at a girl. She got suspended. Summer shoplifted slippers, underwear, and bras. Just two weeks ago, she stole some earphones and stuffed it in her bra. We got into the car and she said, Mom, look what I just took and laughed about it. I'm afraid to say anything to her. I'm afraid of her. Summer's run away 15 times, but it's only been twice that I've called the police. Summer also experimented a lot with drugs. I started doing drugs when I was about 11 years old. Coke, ecstasy, shooting up meth and heroin, acid. And she wanted to try LSD. She got kicked out of high school for having marijuana on her. She uh, beat up one of her friends. Summer's anger was eventually directed towards my ex-husband and me. Summer threatens to kill her father, poison him, stab him. She comes at me with everything she has. She's going to kick me, scratch me, punch me in the jaw. Summer got violent with me when I came into her room. She came charging at me and got me in a chokehold and knocked me down. I thought she was going to break my neck. I did kind of overpower her. I put her on the ground in chokehold because I took MMA. After the fight, my hand was all black and blue and swollen. Summer has been arrested for shoplifting, possession of stolen property, and for drugs. I feel like her life's spinning out of control. Okay, so the two of you agree on one thing, and that is that she is behaving in a self-destructive way. Yes. Correct? Yes. You, you two do agree on that? Yes. Do you agree on anything else? Well, we both agree that, you know, we haven't been the best of parents when it comes to the divorce scenario and providing a stable home for her. Okay, how so? What, 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 what have you failed to really provide and what have you done wrong? Well, currently, we're, we don't own our own home, you know, so I'm living in an apartment. She's living with her mother, and, um, yeah, I mean, she's living with me, and uh, she doesn't have that, you know, mother figure there with her. And so um, we both agree that, you know, we kind of failed. We missed the mark when it comes to uh, raising your, your child. And, uh, what was more important than providing a stable environment for your child? 
just making sure that um, she was in good hands all the time. We, everywhere she well, went. No, you, you said I didn't provide a good, we, we did not provide a good environment for our child, right? You agree on mm -hmm. that? Uh, I'm saying, so that lost out to something. What was more important than that? There was nothing more important. Based on that. results, that's yeah. not true. Based on results, other things crowded that out. I just want to know what they were. Yeah, I think that we, I decided that we would probably parent separate, be better parents separated than we would together because of the arguing and the fighting. There wasn't anything that I decided to choose <clears throat> over raising my daughter and providing a okay. good home for her. Let me say something. Let's say we're sitting here in these chairs and right out there a fire breaks out. Okay, and now we can go put that fire out or we can go do something else. And if we choose instead to go backstage and get something to drink, then that, based on results, was more important than putting that fire out. It's, I'm not asking about intention. I'm asking about based on results. You two adults mm -hmm. made some decisions, either individually or collectively, that something was more important than providing a stable environment for your child. I'm just wanting to know what she lost out to. That's what I want to know. What was more important to you than providing a stable environment for your child? Well, <clears throat> Ray has not provided a stable environment. Okay. Ray has not provided a stable environment for So some. this is the problem. Yes. The problem's not with you. I'm not saying it's not all <clears throat> me, but a lot of it is him. Mm -hmm. So you gave him control? I didn't have, <clears throat> I didn't have a choice when we separated the courts gave him physical custody because I uh, never worked. I was a stay-at-home mom. So when courts don't give custody to fathers because there are stay-at-home mothers. Sorry, forensic psychologist doesn't happen. Been an officer of the court a number of times. That, that's not why they give. That's not why they give custody to someone else. Mm -hmm. It's basically a woman's court. If they give primary custody to a father, there's usually a glaring reason. I'm just asking what it is. Couldn't take care of her. I didn't have money. That's not true. But if that's your story, this is informative to me, because yeah. frankly, I'm here for one reason. That's summer. Yes. And you guys are here for I don't know why, uh, but this is not a summer problem. This is a family problem. She didn't come out of the womb with a mission to shoplift. She didn't come out of the womb with a mission to get in fights. She didn't come out with a womb with a mission to get into drugs. She learned that, mm -hmm. and that was environmental, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm just curious, what was more important to you guys than providing an environment that would have been healthy and stable? To me, there was nothing more important. It was always, the focus was on the family, providing a house and a, and a home for, for my family. And based on some things that happened in the marriage, um, I decided that it was better that we parent mm -hmm. separately then together. Did you fight in front of her? Yeah. Uh, well, we tried not to. Have you called the cops on your wife? Yeah. Was your daughter there? Yes. Well, she was sleeping. So yeah, it was. It was. A, it was. Thought she was a really small house. Yeah, but she was not awake. She was not awake. She was asleep in her bed when it happened, and we were quiet. Yeah, this is getting real clear. <laughs> Seriously, I, I'm. I'm, you may feel like I'm throwing you under the bus here. I frankly don't care about your egos. I care about your daughter. Did I understand earlier that you asked her to leave because you had an affair? It was a friend from high school. He's known me since I was 15. Not, it was Facebook, and I was visiting <clears throat> friends from high school, and it wasn't something planned. It was something that just, Sorry? Why, why didn't I plan on having an affair? I, it was a friend from high school. I was very unhappy in the marriage, neglected, called names constantly, and someone just said the right things and paid attention to me, and it just happened. So that would be a yes. <laughs> you had an affair. <clears throat> so you see, you have to understand, based on results, you have not provided mm -hmm. a stable environment for your daughter. You all had it. A difference between you say he's calling you names and putting you down, berating you, belittling you. So you turn to an old boyfriend, you get involved there. Then, you know, the house is gone. Now you're living in an apartment. Then everybody's saying, oh, I can't do this anymore. She's going to go with her mother. I can't afford her. 
Uh, so I'm just looking at, based on results, I'm not asking myself why this child's making bad choices. I'm asking myself why not? Why, why would she not make bad choices? <laughs> and I don't question your intentions. No, I, and I really don't question your intentions. I have no doubt you love your daughter, right? Without a doubt. You love your yes. daughter? Love her. Yeah. But you decided to go have an affair. You didn't mean to, it just happened. You, know, you hate it when that happens. Then he gets upset about that. Then y'all go, then it breaks up. Now she's in the middle saying, what the hell? Well, let's take a break. Uh, and when we come back, we're going to meet this team and we're going to hear about the potentially deadly fight that got Summer and Ray thrown in jail, both of them. Uh, we're going to talk about all of that and more and meet her right after the break. I was holding the scissors like this, you know, like a knife, like you're about to stab somebody. And she was just pointing them, saying, I'm going to kill you. The scissor fight was a big fight. If my parents say that I'm out of control, they're the main reason why. I was shoplifting because my dad wouldn't buy me anything, so I pretty much had to get it myself. I had a girlfriend who tried touching my boyfriend. I broke her nose. She had blood all over her jacket and her nose was literally like crooked and she couldn't breathe out of her nose for like over a month. When I turned 13 is when my dad started choking me and throwing me on the ground and close fist punching me in the face. He'll stand in my way, he'll be like, oh, you trying to act tough, you trying to act tough. He was like, I don't know who you think you are. He's like, go on, fight me, fight me. I had a fight with my mom. The fight was over a phone charger and she threw my phone at my face and she dislocated my shoulder. I ran away on my bicycle and she was screaming, you're a bitch. She was like, yeah, right away on that bike, you for it. My parents don't understand where I'm coming from. They don't understand who I am and they don't see what they're doing to me and what they tell me and certain things they do around me is making me do what I'm doing. Well, but I think what this family does understand is that Summer started going downhill when her mom, Dina, was caught having an affair. Let's listen to this. I was very unhappy in the marriage. Summer didn't know anything about the affair. Ray was trying to turn Summer against me, saying mom's a cheater. I was always put in the middle of adult situations. My mom would always run to me and she was like helpless. She can't even get a clue. My mom would put me in the middle of their sexual intimacy and she would tell me how my dad would rape her. And I don't know what in her right mind can make her think that she could tell a kid that. I found out that Dina was seeing another man. She was trying to maintain that relationship by telephone. When I threatened to take away the phone, she tried to beat me up. I made a police report. They charged her with domestic violence. I obtained a restraining order. My anger towards my dad happened when he kicked my mom out of the house. My mom didn't choose to move. He literally threw her stuff out. Well, Summer is joining us now. I'm glad you're here. Um, how do you feel about being here? Um, I feel pretty good because I get to express the way I feel, and they never really gave me the time for that. Well, well let's talk about you for a minute. I, I've got a list I actually made um, that I, I, I hate that this is true. This is just a short period of time. But this is your rap sheet, essentially. Uh, 2010, three-day school suspension for throwing a rock at a girl in the eighth grade. 2011, charged with shoplifting, $75 worth of merchandise. The charges got dropped later, but you did steal the stuff, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. 2012, uh, you, you reported twice as a missing person. Uh, Ray says you've run away like 15 times. I ran away because he was beating me and made me feel so worthless about myself. Well, that's not true because I asked him if he was doing anything to contribute to this problem and what was more important than creating an environment, and he couldn't think of a damn thing. That's because he tries to make himself look so good. Uh, so one of y'all is not telling the truth. March 12, cops called. Uh, you get a warning after arguing with Ray about leaving the house. March 13, you charged with possession, uh, designated substances. Uh, you took your mother's Xanax. Yeah, I did. But who won it when I had them too as a parent? Okay. Uh, March 13, you're charged with the petty theft of the of the Xanax. 
Then you're charged with battery. I just can't take it anymore, and I act out with violence because that's all I've gotten shown my whole life. Well, now, we know that's not true, too, because she said she couldn't think of a thing that she did here either. April 13th, you're charged with domestic violence because you threatened Ray's life with scissors, and you spent three days in juvie. There was a vicious fight with my dad. The scissor fight was a big fight. I saw Summer shoving something in a cigarette pack. I didn't know what it was. I asked for it. She wouldn't give it to me. She had stolen my Xanax and Tramadol. In that fight, my dad choked me, slapped me, threw me on the ground, and hit me. I heard Summer screaming, Mom, help me. Mom, help me. He's hurting me. And then she said, Mom, I can't breathe. Please help me. I've had bruises all up and down my legs. She would punch and kick me in anything to try to get through the doorway. And when she found out that wasn't going to work, she resorted to scissors. At that point, she said, if you don't get out of my way, I'm going to stab you. I say, go ahead, because I'm right here. I tried to stab him. I was going to kill him. I was holding the scissors like this, you know, like a knife, like you're about to stab somebody. And she was just pointing them, saying, I'm going to kill you. Immediately, I grabbed her wrist right there. She tried to turn her wrist towards my hand. And so I tried to like bend my wrist and try to like stab his arm. Resulted in me and my dad both getting arrested. And my dad went to jail for a domestic violence and battery against me and my mom. And I got assault with a deadly weapon. That was self-defense and it got dropped. Right, charges got they, dropped. That's why they let me out of juvies because it was self-defense. Well, July 13, you're charged with possession of marijuana and you're expelled from high school in the 10th grade. Did you start using heroin and meth? Yeah, I started using that when I was like 14. Smoking weed since you were 11? Yeah. You tried cocaine at 11? Mm-hmm. I'm Dr. Phil. <laughs> I don't think we've met. Because this doesn't sound like the guy I met before when you were saying. Okay. Don't know. Can't help you. I'm raising a family. I'm working hard. I'm providing a house. I'm putting food in the home. 14 years of marriage. She never had to work. These guys have gone on vacations. You know, they've had a good life. There's no reason why you needed to go out and do what you did. You did it because you wanted to, and you wanted to experiment. You're caught up in being popular, looking good, dating boys, and it, it got away from you. Let's just face it. You're, you're not- Let's face it that you're abusive and you need to get over the fact that you shouldn't be treating women this way, and you treat us with respect and don't put hands on us. Have you, have you been in a physical fight with your daughter? I've with withhold her from leaving the house. I'm merely trying to keep her under control. Yeah. She says that you're hitting her. No. You, you've, you've never hit her? No. That is a lie. That Has is a he hit you? lie. He has hit me, she's seen it. How could you sit on stage Tell and make me. yourself look like an idiot? Tell me. When did I hit you? You've been hitting okay. me? I've been being watching spanked you abuse is not Josh. You ask her the question, let her answer. You being abuse Josh? And, and being disciplined is not hitting you. You got arrested for beating my brother when he was little. There again. I've watched you beat my mom my whole life, thrown Define her on the ground, beating. ripped her shirt up, red marks all over. No, that's no? discipline. That's discipline. For my mother? Who do you think it, you are? You're not her father. I'm in charge of the household. That's who I am. Have you thrown your wife on the ground and hit her? No. You have not yes, thrown your wife has. on the ground. Yes, he has. He threw me on the floor and ripped my shirt right in front of my son, who was five at the time, and he was crying. I had to leave my mom alone. This is untrue. First of all, it was an argument where you, you started slapping me and pulling out my shirt, and my shirt ended up being in your hands. Who wouldn't slap you? You were on the ground only because you were trying to pull me to the ground through my shirt. Have you it's been in physical fights with your daughter? A couple of them. Did you dislocate her shoulder? No. No. You didn't dislocate my shoulder? Summer, your shoulder. So did he not take me to the hospital and was my shoulder have not? Have you called no, her a her shoulder was have not? You, have you called her a bitch, I, white trash whore? Well, I did because she almost broke my neck on the floor. She twisted. I think she was under a substance at that time. Um, she, her, and I have only gotten into a couple of fights. We don't usually get into fights. Have you told her that Ray rapes you? Have I told? Um, yes. Have you shared graphic details with her about your sex life? Not graphic, no. Graphic. graphic. Did you tell her you were having an affair? No, he did. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here because 
I, I need it. <laughs> uh, uh, we come back. Summer says running away to Vegas with a boy she had only known four days was the worst mistake of her life. Okay, we'll talk about that when we come back. We're back. I'm here with Ray, uh, his ex-wife, Dina, and uh, their daughter, Summer. Ray says his daughter has run away at least 15 times. Last time she ran away, it was to Vegas. Dina says it was a month-long ordeal. She said it involved drugs, homelessness, panhandling, a serious and dangerous physical attack on her. Police get involved. Summer says she had no choice but to leave home because her dad was beating her. Take a look. I ran away from home because my dad was beating me. He was like, you know what, go kill yourself. It would save me money, but if you do kill yourself, don't do it in my house because I want to clean up your mess. I was with my boyfriend and he told me, I want to make a better life for you. Let's move away, let's live together. And we were only dating for four days and I was dumb enough to be like, okay, yeah, let's go. Summer had told me that she was gonna run away. Dad's treating me bad. No matter what you say, mom, I'm gonna go. I just disappeared and I became a missing person. Detectives were looking for me. I was homeless. My boyfriend would put me on the street and ask people for money. I'd make about $70 a day, but he wouldn't feed me. He used all the money and just bought drugs. I went like over a month without eating and I dropped all the way to 90 pounds. This one guy demanded money that I didn't have because I stayed in his house for three days and he kept all of my clothes. So I broke into the house to go get my stuff and he came out of his room and he lifted me off my feet and choked me as hard as he could. He shattered my windpipe. He choked me until everything went black. I woke up with nothing on and he was laying on top of me and his pants were halfway down. And I started freaking out. I started screaming for someone to help me and that's when his neighbor saw me. I got a call from a guy that told me, your daughter's crazy. She's saying crazy things. She's on drugs, come and get your daughter. Ray drove out to Vegas that night. Bad stuff happened in Vegas. Vegas wasn't a good idea. No, it wasn't. It was the worst thing that I've ever been through and the scariest for me to get choked and pretty much like raped by a random guy in Vegas. He says you ran away because he refused to let you be with a 19 year old boyfriend and to stay at his house, at, to stay with this boyfriend. Well, you see, if that was the case, <clears throat> I wouldn't have even ran away. I would have just stayed there and not told him about my boyfriend or where I was going. I'd just hang out with him. Mm -hmm. But the real reason why is because I couldn't take him anymore. Like, why am I running away all these times? Like I ran away, what, 16 times? Because I can't stand him and he makes me feel so worthless and so like, I'm nothing. That's not true. You asked if he could come to our house and sleep on our couch. And if I agreed to that, that you were gonna be happy, you would go to school every day, and that you weren't, you weren't gonna run away. You said that if I didn't do that, that if I didn't care for him, I didn't care for you. Which isn't true. I care about you by blocking you from him. If you cared about me so much, then why would you hit me and call me names and make me feel like I'm nothing and that I'm worthless to where I had to try to commit suicide like 28 times? Everything I did was to try to distract you from getting what you wanted. Everything you did ruined me. Wrong. Well, you need to listen to your mom and dad when they care most about you. Listen they to you guys when you guys show a really bad example my whole life. I started dating when I was in third grade. I lost my virginity at 13. Anywhere I walk, there's somebody honking, saying things to me like hot mama, and like even girls hit on me. It's pretty crazy. Anywhere I walk, there's somebody honking, screaming at me, whistling, saying things to me like hot mama, and like even girls hit on me. It's pretty crazy. A summer dress is too risque. She likes to wear clothes that show cleavage. I'd wear shorter shorts. And that's just how I dress for the summertime at the beach, like, you know, but I guess it's just the way I look because I'm just like pretty blonde girl. I look. And it's attracting older guys because she lies about her age. 
I actually like the attention just because my parents never really gave me attention. My mom never complimented me. My dad never complimented me when I was a kid. So I pretty much like look for it in other people. When I see this relationship with these 40 year old men and my 16 year old daughter, there's nothing good that can come of that relationship. I started dating when I was in third grade. I feel that Summer's not making good choices with men because she doesn't have a good male role model. I lost my virginity at 13. I was drunk at a Halloween party and I don't even really remember. What is a win for you here? Where, where do you think this is headed? I want to go to college for cosmetology or um, to be a social worker or psychology. <clears throat> and I want to uh, help abuse children because I never got the help that I needed. So I want to help other kids. Mm -hmm. And do you think the choices that you're making now um, are going to put you on that path? I've actually turned my life around and now I'm like going to school and I've been staying with my mom and I've been doing things that I need to be doing because I realized that I'm not going to get anywhere if I just keep going down the path that I was going down. Uh, how, how do you think it's going with her staying with you? She has a boyfriend that's 22 years old that's in jail that she's totally worried about constantly looking him up on the internet to see his his when his court date is and worried about when he's going to get out and that she's going to be with him and she wants a baby with him. She's not well, that's doing a different good. version than you just gave me. You just said, I've turned my life around. I've now matured. I've got it straight. I want to help the world. So uh, I want to having get a boyfriend. Thing. And she says, no, actually, she's not. She's obsessed with this 22-year-old guy that's in jail and wants to have a baby. Wait, so me having a boyfriend has to be me not going down well, right are path. You choosing, are, are, are you choosing well? She's always on Facebook, Instagram, telling me about 28-year-old. 28 year olds and, and she shows me pictures of them. I mean, guys that are total dirt bags with covered in tattoos. Look, I'm like, and she shows me, mom, look at these guys. They think I'm hot. They want to be with me. 28 years old. And I said, that's not going to happen. We, we got to do something here. She, she is out of control. Yeah. When people ask for help. You know, I, I, I know they're serious about it. And so I was glad to get a letter from you. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't get a letter from you. Something that I, I would have done. I got a letter from you. Oh, no, I didn't get a letter from you. I got a letter from your aunt. Uh, Teresa, thank you for writing the letter, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm glad you did. What made you write the letter now instead of a year ago or a year from now? You don't really need me to tell you that. I guess you always hope for the best. And I'm not the one to go out and ask for help from everybody. Okay? I provide for my family. I've done it by myself and under my own ability. If you provide so well, why'd I have to go out and get a job myself and pay for my own phone bill and pay for my own phone? You had all pay those for things. all my own makeup and all my own stuff now. You've had all those things. How do you expect me to act like 16 when I have to do everything that adults do? And here's a novel concept. Adults are going to talk about adult issues without involving children. Okay, so I'm going to ask the child to excuse us for a few minutes so I can talk to you parents uh, without her here. So we're going to do that after the break. Well, I'm back with Dina and Ray. I just asked their uh, lovely daughter, uh, Summer, and she is a, a lovely young woman, to excuse us so I could talk to you two. Um, Y'all were married for 14 years, right? Um, and then you say that you separated from Ray because you felt alone. And uh, Ray says Dina hooked up with an old high school guy friend and refused to end the affair. So he got a restraining order and he kicked her out of the house. And uh, he says there's not been any turmoil in front of this child. Um, uh, which I think is wrong. Let, let me say a couple of things. I, I didn't just come in on a load of turnips and I get that your daughter is the quintessential drama queen. I, I get that she can take a story this big 
and make it this big and she layers it and she's tried to commit suicide 28 times and she's impaled herself in the stomach and she's done all of this stuff which um, is just simply not true and I, I get that you, you get that I get that sure uh, you get that I, mm -hmm. I get that mm -hmm. so if you divide everything she says by 10 and just get down to a tenth of what she's saying is true, this is out of control chaos. And you are a big part of it, and you are a big part of it, and you collectively are a big part of it. And she is caught in the middle of this emotional quagmire, and she's 16 years old. Her brain isn't even through growing yet. And if she started experimenting with drugs at 11, and she started doing them fairly seriously at 13 or 14, then she's right. Emotionally, she's not 16, she's 12. Because one of the things we know when kids start doing drugs in that way, with their brains undeveloped, that development stops, reasoning stops, the ability to see around corners stops, all of those things stop. And so you're dealing with someone that is 16 but has not developed or has regressed to a much less mature level of problem solving. Okay, do, do you get that? So I, I realize we're dealing with a child. I, I realize that she says that she presents the picture that you've had her on the ground pounding her in the face with a closed fist. I know that's not true. I get that, but I also know that you have lost your temper, you have crossed the line, you have not had good parenting. Just by what you admit mm -hmm. to, what you have the insight to, you, you, you have no clue about what to do with this girl, correct? That's correct. And you've basically said, I, you know, I'm, I wash my hands here. Unfortunately, that's not one of the options. Right. Okay? <laughs> Seriously, there's, there's, no window, there's no window you go to where you check out. Sorry, I, uh, I'm just I'm worn out, so I'm going to sign out here well, and give her back. You don't do that. We're trying You're to her get, father. We're trying to get a hold of her before she turns 18. I realize that time is ticking. And, you know, if I invite her back into the house to continue what she's doing, it's not going to go anywhere. She's she not going to learn her lesson. Well, let me tell you. I'm she, not checking out. I'm trying to bring justice to the doorstep. The most powerful role model in any child's life is the same-sex parent. That would be you. <laughs> when it comes to parents, you've lost your way. I'm not trying to insult you, I'm trying to inform you. You have lost your way. The most powerful role model in any child's life is the same-sex parent. That would be you. <laughs> you have a lot of ownership here. You have a lot of ownership here. You, do you get that? I get that. You have overshared with your daughter. Mm -hmm. Inappropriate. Inappropriate. When a daughter doesn't feel really special to their father, they have a hunger for male attention. They have a hunger for male validation and acceptance and, and all of the things that come usually from a relationship with the male father figure yeah. in their life. That makes her vulnerable to anybody that comes along and tells her what she wants to hear then that makes her vulnerable to that. So you have a lot of ownership in that. But couldn't it also be true that she decided that getting the attention from the, 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 the guys that she's seeing is more exciting? The attention that she gets from me is just, that's my dad. Yeah, he loves me. Yeah, he takes me to dinner. Yeah, he buys me clothes. Yeah, he takes me on vacations. But when she's looking for that love relationship, that something that's outside of the mom and dad thing, I'm not going to be able to give that to her. I mean, I hug her, but it's kind of like eh, on the shoulder now. It's some, there was a separation there that there was a gap that 
perhaps I couldn't cross. I mean, I can't build the bridge that far. Um, there's not enough time. <laughs> um, there's, there's not enough time for me to tell you what's wrong with that logic. <laughs> Uh, but I'm gonna, I'll give you a 30-second preview, okay? It's not about do you compete with the thrill of a romantic love or a girl finding a boy that, that gets her all excited about being part of a couple. It's about a father that teaches a daughter to value herself. It's about a daughter that wakes up every day and knows that there is a man in this world that she thinks is 10 feet tall, that she respects and looks up to, who thinks that she is special and wonderful and valuable. And because she has that self-esteem and self-worth, she will not let some guy use her body, use her life, use her emotions for his playground or to entertain himself. So no, you're not trying to compete with some guy that's giving her romantic attention. You are trying to teach her to love herself by feeling loved from you, and therefore she values herself and says, no, 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 you will not entertain yourself with me, and then you walk away, and I'm left in a trailer park with a baby because I am worth more than that, and I know that because my daddy taught me that. Let, let, let me just cut to the chase here. Um, you, you guys ran over your head. I don't know how you found each other, but it was a dark day <laughs> that you found each other. It did not yield good things in either of your lives, right? I think you're nice people individually, but collectively, you're toxic. Mm -hmm. And what I, I'm going to tell you is that Right now, she should not be living with either one of you. Um, she really shouldn't. Um, this girl needs some very specialized help here. So I am going to recommend that she be placed in a very uh, specific, specific placement here. It's called the Center for Discovery. And it's located in Whittier, California. Uh, Dr. Rachel Wood is here. Talk about this a little bit, what you think would be in store for her. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Discovery Program is a highly structured, nurturing environment that was specifically designed to treat the very things we've seen here today. Um, we would love an opportunity to work with Summer and her parents. I am going to make to you a, an offer of this to you as a gift to your family and to your daughter to arrange for her to be placed in this facility. And here's the catch. Everything has a catch. And this is a big one. You two have at least as much work to do on figuring out how to be parents and how to co-parent, and how to receive her back into this world when she comes back. You have at least as much work to do while she's gone as she does while she's gone. Okay? And, and we, will provide, we will provide that help and guidance for you. But believe you me, that is a prerequisite. You have to work while she's gone or she comes back to the same toxicity she left, and we've done nothing except buy a little time. Are you willing to do that? If yes. I get you that professional help, are you willing to take it and figure out not only what you've done wrong in the past, but what you need to do right in the future? Yes. And are you willing to do that? Yeah. I am going to allow you guys to go back and explain this to her and make this offer to her. This is your first parenting test 
because it is your job to get her there. It is your job to get her there. And if that requires a transporter yeah. who takes her there against her will, mm -hmm. then that's fine. But you two mm -hmm. have to come together, shoulder to shoulder, stand your ground, and make this happen. You can compel her to go to this program. And I expect that you will do exactly that. Fair enough? Yeah. All right. If you're dealing with a defiant teen, go to drphil.com, where I have posted resources and more information about what you can do, what you can do in your home, what you can do if it's gone beyond your home. And uh, I want to thank my guests for being here today. I mean, you guys are important teaching tools for others that aren't here today. Um, and a special thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thanks so much. Thanks so much to the Center from Discovery. And I will, in advance, thank the West Shield Adolescent Transport Company uh, because uh, yeah. they are on the premises, and if needed, they will do what is necessary. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much.